Hi everyone and welcome to Beyond Tomorrow, a new series from the New Zealand Herald in partnership with MYOB where we tackle the unprecedented business environment affecting thousands of small and medium sized enterprises across New Zealand whilst the world battles to slow the spread of the novel coronavirus. I'm Will Trafford and every day I'm joined by Ingrid Cronin Knight, MYOB's country manager. Hey Ingrid. Hey Will, great to be back today and particularly on a day we've had some positive news. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and and someone else who's also uh, going to be pretty positive and helpful in this discussion, Andrew Barnes. He's an entrepreneur, founder and director of New Zealand's largest corporate trustee company, Perpetual Guardian, and also a philanthropist. Andrew, thanks so much for giving us some of your time. Hi, Will. Hi, Ingrid. Today we're talking all about uh, prepping our SMEs for what we're calling the new normal, essentially what the economy and markets will look like as we emerge from lockdown and track down the alert levels. Big news today, Ingrid, on what New Zealand will look like at level three. No face-to-face -face retail, but there's some e-com options, phone orders, construction is back, all of these sort of businesses where there's not really customer-facing functions, right? Yeah, I think there was... Some positive uh, news where they felt that in level three, around a million people could return into the workplaces. Obviously, to do that, you need to um, have done a review of your plan and uh, in line with uh, uh, the safety guidelines and with WorkSafe, they'll provide some, some guidance here. But, you know, keeping your people safe as they come back into the premises, it does mean that there's no customer facing activity, uh, but you can do uh, you know, online trading, uh, contactless uh, you know, click and collect or phone to order. And, and, and it also allows um, you know, educational uh, arms for both uh, the schools and early childhood centres for up to you know, year 10 to open, which I think will make a difference for workers. Now, some of that's voluntary. And then interregional um, interregional travel is still off the cards unless you're an essential worker, but you can actually now start to broaden your tran transit outside of the local area into the regional yeah, I mean, one of the things that I guess the key takeaways was you, you talked about is uh, kids getting back to school and, and the older ones who can perhaps look after themselves, they can still stay at home. So you're minimising the risk there. And then on the low end where you've got, you know, young kids and stuff like that, they are kind of, you know, going to be allowed back into the system, which will let parents get back to work. Andrew, what were your thoughts on the announcement in terms of what level three looks like? Comfortable with it? Broadly, yes. Um, I mean, I think one of the challenges for me is, that if you actually look objectively on the criteria that we had before, um, we probably should have stayed in three and shouldn't have gone to four. Um, I think, you know, we're now going back to three or three plus at a position that's probably worse than the position was when we went from three to four last time round. But I think, you know, it is critical if we're going to minimise the impact on the economy, uh, getting back to some degree of normality as quick as possible. Uh, I think is, is, you know, it's an absolute imperative as far as the government is concerned. So I think it's a good step in the right direction. Would I have gone a little bit further? Possibly. What, what sort of areas are you, are you sort of talking about? And I guess because we don't have a great deal of economic metrics other than what comes from government about how badly this has hurt business. What's your gauge on how, how sort of... Well, look, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be self-isolating on the island of Waiheke. I'm hoping it's going to last till Christmas, frankly. But, you know, if I look, our local butcher's closed. Now, why was that? We had a, could have had the self-isolating line, could have continued to serve customers. Instead, we concentrated everybody into the supermarket. Okay. I can't see that that was any healthier. And so I felt that we destroyed other businesses or at least put them under serious pressure when we probably shouldn't have done. I think a measured approach, I'm not saying every retailer at all, but I think a lot of other food, um, food shops could have stayed open. Your local butcher could have stayed open. You know, things like that, I think, would have been, would have been pragmatic. Um, and that also would have, have actually probably spread us out a bit more rather than concentrating everybody in the, in the queue to the supermarket. I want to go into a bit of a boot camp mode, though, as we do sometimes in terms of what all small and medium-sized enterprises should be doing now, now that we know what you know, level three might look like from next week. Ingrid, you, 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 the key big, big thing for you is planning, right? Plan, plan, plan. 
Yeah, well, cash flow and plan. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, critical things uh, to consider are really what you're going to do from a cash flow perspective to help you get through uh, to when, you know, we get to level two. I was on a um, briefing uh, today from Phil Twyford and he suggested that uh, you know, level three is a, a test to see whether or not we can put those um, practices in place and, and it's most likely that we'll be there for at least a month was the kind of guidance. And so if you, if you take that, and consider that then as you think about planning out for um, your coming back to lockdown, what you can look at is what can you trade with your clients? Now, I think that what we're going to see is a bit of pent up demand. So th there'll be a, a number of people that do want to actually access a, a number of things. And so you might see stock levels not quite there uh, in terms of, you know, ready to service them. But um, I wouldn't necessarily advise ordering, uh, you know, massive amounts uh, based on what you see in the first few days because the demand, I think, will have a, a little bit of a blip and then come down. But what you need to think about is both your people, your premises, um, and then your uh, your your, your sort of supply chain for your customers. Uh, and so from a people side, um, you know, getting them ready, they, they still recommend that as many people work from home as possible. Uh, but as you get them into your premises, you want to plan for how you keep those premises safe, um, how you get the social distancing in there, how you um, ensure that any through that supply chain, if you are going to go digital or have a click and collect, how you uh, enable that and contactless payments uh, for your clients. As, you, as you've got that sorted, then you can start thinking about actually your cash flow which I think yeah, get, hopefully you've been in touch with your clients and working out when they can pay uh, and then you can be in touch with your uh, those that you that you need to and work out when you pay it and get, get really crystal clear about day one day two yeah Andrew give me some priority sort of tips if you were you know talking to some young startups and stuff like that organizing things what have they got to do first given I guess we got well, what under a week potentially until this thing goes down to three You've got your two issues, as Ingrid said. You've got your people and you've got your cash flow. Now, the old adage is cash is king. If you're focusing on your business surviving, actually making sure that you've got adequate cash to get through the next period is, you know, as a business person, that has to be the number one priority. And I think the danger is that we cannot predict because we've not gone for a herd immunity strategy, we've gone for elimination. There is a significant risk of a W-shaped strategy here. We could bounce in and out of three and four. So the worst thing that you could do, I think, is come into this level anticipating that it's going to be three plus three to two. Mm. And as Ingrid says, you, you look to order more, you, you're thinking about how you're going to grow and expand out of this. And the next second we head back into four. So, you know, it, you've got to be, agile i think through this process both with your people and with your cash flow to understand that he's not necessarily going to be a smooth transition out of this we've talked um with ingrid about reviewing systems i guess to sort of operate if you can at this level three even knowing that it might go back up to four um what are some of the things that you could do given what we now know i've got some sort of tech notes around here about um you know food companies in terms of you know, maybe listing on Uber Eats or doing something like emails if you're afraid to lose the margin that you might have with Uber Eats? Because I guess one of the big things is contact tracing. Look, yeah, look, again, I think you've got to be very careful on your business model. Um, be interested to say, Ingrid's probably seen more of this than I, but, but the danger is trying to pivot your business model without a proper understanding of the implications of what that does to your cash flow, your business, your future clients, where your, your company is going to be... Um, uh, positioned post this you know i think you've got to be careful with that but you want to be positive uh, if i look back in my career the times that actually the best deals have always come the best opportunities have always come is in a point of crisis and i'm old enough frankly i go back pre the stock market crash of 87 so you know, I've seen this time and time and time and time again, and the opportunities arise if you are nimble, if you are positive, if you are rethinking, you're prepared to be creative. If you're prepared to be creative, there are going to be big opportunities coming out of this. And the more flexible your business, the more chance you have of picking them up, because a lot of the traditional companies are going to be struggling with significant restructuring 
probably for quite some time. So bizarrely, the SME, I think, is well positioned to take advantage of this. That is the sort of optimism, I suppose, there, right? Especially if you look at the fact that level three seems to be very geared towards, because you need the contact tracing, e-commerce. And these kind of businesses that already have, you know, lower outgoings than some of the big, big uh, companies anyway, right, Ingrid? Yeah, look, I think that gives you a channel to interact and trade goods. Uh, you know, we know from a courier company perspective, Perspective. They've got to run a van, whether it's got one package or 37 packages, in it, you know, whatever. So they would prefer to have more demand given that they've got a network. Uh, and I, I think, um, you know, whilst disappointed that I can't get to my hairdresser at level three, there will be a number of organisations that are looking to take uh, advantage of this uh, from a point of view of client um, uh, I guess not client facing, but being able to deliver the clients the goods. I do think that what that means, though, is that day one, as you come out of lockdown, uh, if you haven't done it beforehand, and hopefully you have been in communications with your clients, but having a, a conversation around uh, what is it they need now? Because their needs will have changed as well. They'll be constrained. They'll have adapted to potentially not spending the money that they did. And so really exploring, I think, what's the new normal for them and where their thinking has got to, and so Andrew's really pointed out uh, you know, that that this, you know that SME business leaders can be nimble because there's usually decision making of one that, and so they can really adapt if they do listen um, to what the clients are. But finding out the new normal, and also you know you might need to if you're a, a plumber or an electrician, and they have you know made those two examples that you can come back and start start doing work, but you need to make sure that you're isolated from the occupants of the house that you're working on or the property. Well, if, if that's the case for, for them, I, th I think it's um, good that they can get back to work, but are there areas where they could um, look at their business and, and you know, think about how, how they have done it and then could they do it more or differently? Uh, and so I'm using those, those are sort of the tradie examples. They'll just be great and get some income coming in, which is good that we're, get, we're getting that. But, but from a business perspective, I think there's a lot of innovation that I'm seeing in the market as people are rethinking it. And so before you get into those people consultation processes, you might need to, I always think looking at the market and how it's changed, getting that market feedback, and, uh, and then once you've got a really sense of the options that you want to then maybe pivot your business to or try out uh, is, is don't get fooled by the initial blip in demand. You know, you want to see it through that. And then from there, what you can then go is, okay, so how do I now need to optimize supply chain? And then what do I do with my people um, and, and through the particular process? Yeah, Andrew, give us some tips on, on how to think then. If you've been running an SME in a, in a very, not necessarily an old school way, but you've stuck to your knitting and that's been really good for you up till now because maybe your SME is five or six years old or something. It wasn't even around for the 08 crisis. I'm a great believer. Somebody asked me, what, what's the best thing you could do at the moment? And I think the answer is think. It's actually take the time to think. It's very tempting to instantly come out and react, just react. You know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to change that, I've got to change that, chase that customer. Now that's fine, we've got to keep the businesses moving, but actually it's having a little bit of quiet consideration about what has worked in lockdown and how much of that you could translate into the future. So for example, um, I guarantee you there are a pile of businesses out there who've just worked out, especially if they're small uh, service-based businesses, who've worked out that actually their, their staff are actually more productive at home. Yeah. Why change that? Actually, is that your future model? You know, you're sitting looking at where I can take costs out of the business. Well, especially if you're a startup and you're down in one of those fantastically expensive um, shared office spaces, Actually, maybe you don't need that anymore. Maybe actually there is a new normal and the new normal is once a week. And I had this conversation with one of my CEOs this morning. Um, then is the new normal going to the office one day a week to socialize? Yeah. And do you stay at home and work? Now, you know, that is radical. But actually, if you start to think about that, that it may be not so much, you know, more productivity, you know, you know, I'm a great fan of flexible working arrangements, but more, more productivity um, and also a healthier, happier workforce. And you've just cut a massive chunk out of your uh, rent bill. 
like what I'm really excited about, and I've said this a couple of times, but is the new skills that people have learnt in this process of, of lockdown. They've learnt how to connect virtually. They've learnt how to run their business um, you know, via uh, uh, digital means. And I think that that can mean everything from the way we run staff meetings is shorter, sharper, but, but digitally can mean um, that the way you interact with clients now, if I think about accountants and bookkeepers who we have a large client base of, you know, for some they've only been seeing their clients once a year, maybe every GST cycle. But now with the latest digital information, they can meet them and have a rewarding conversation via Zoom every 30, um, sorry, 30 minutes every couple of months. And so that the changing nature of how you can interact with your clients, I think is pretty exciting from the new skills that people have learned. I, I agree with that. And, and, and if you look at it from the context of, of four day week, there was a, a very, you know, an interesting trial in, in Microsoft Japan last year. Uh, three things, Microsoft Teams, uh, no meeting more than half an hour, no more than five people in a meeting, 39.9% improvement in productivity. Now, there are lots of these things. That's what I'm saying. And I agree with Ingrid, absolutely. You've got a workforce that suddenly has been forced to adapt to flexible working. And there are lots and lots of benefits about that. And I, I know from my own experience, and I guess, Ingrid, it's probably the same with you, that I have, I've, I've spent literally from nine o'clock, in fact, actually eight o'clock this morning, to now on Zoom calls, but not just, you know, where I would have normally been just talking with people in the office. I've been interacting with people, you know, broadly all over the world through the medium of, of Zoom or varying other things. And actually, if I was doing that, actually focusing on that, it was part of my business, I'm actually servicing my clients potentially better in this world because I'm being forced to make the effort to contact, to understand what their issues are. And I think those things are really positive. And I think businesses that take those lessons forward are going to be in very good shape. Yeah, and don't underestimate the value of it to employees as well, because I was working uh, for a company um, about two years ago in the UK. And when the coders got the option to work from home, I mean, it was their absolute dream. They were the biggest advocates of it ever. They talked about, you know, not, not having to travel to work or all, all, all the nightmare of hopping on the tube and all this kind of stuff. And, and they said that they felt like they wanted to give more to the business because, because they were at home. One of them would say, well, you know, I'd code till three in the morning on occasions because I knew that I really wanted to get that done. And I really, so the minute that you sort of seem to relinquish some of the, the really controlling aspects of, of work hours and stuff like that, it seems like for those people for which it works, obviously not for everyone, it, it, it seems to almost um, take the reins off and allow them to work even potentially harder and possibly a bit more creative. creative. I mean, I think the evidence is out there. And there's been lots of research that indicates if you go to flexible working arrangements, that actually it is extraordinarily positive for the economy. And just at the moment, we need all the help that we can get as far as the economy is concerned. Now, equally, uh, you know, we know that if we could keep free flow going on Auckland's roads, that would be the equivalent of one and a half to two percent on Auckland GDP right there. So there are things that we, um, we should be doing as a community, maybe with, with some support from the government, to actually hang on to some of those benefits. And, and that, I think, is, is one of the things I'm very keen to see that we get as we come out of this crisis, which is not throw away all the good things. Personally, I've liked watching, in you know, looking across to the city and seeing no pollution you can almost pick out houses on the Waitakere's, for heaven's sake. I've never been able to do that in the last six years. So, Andrew, are you sort of saying a government mandate to maybe help some of these leaders who could continue this working from home thing to, to, to ensure that they do, basically, so that you can let those people... You know. Yeah, look, I mean, we're, we're developing an idea at the moment which sort of says once we get through this, we know that some companies will look to um, reduce pay, reduce hours, reduce days of work. They're, they're just going to have to. So what we're then saying is maybe the government should flip its support round. And so instead of paying for the majority, they pay for the minority, either day, that, that extra day that they're reducing, provided that companies invest in identifying how to improve their productivity and also that 
require a proportion of the time that is released for their staff to get new skills, uh, retrain, uh, whatever it is. I mean, we've got this fantastic opportunity to use uh, you know, this crisis to really upskill our workforce when we have got forced downtime. I think that's a really important thing. And by the way, if you were running any company and you were thinking that, to encourage your staff to use any downtime to upskill, and if you could reward that, you know, you, you should and, and could, it would be great. Because I think that's the great thing. If we can come out of this with a, a workforce, as Ingrid said, we've learned a whole pile of stuff. If we could come out of, of this with that, I think it would be fantastic. Hey, Ingrid, talk us through day one, day two out of lockdown. Look, I think on day one, uh, you know, the first thing you've got to do is make sure that your, your premises are safe. And so you'll have that plan. Uh, that'll be, need to be published to your people, to your clients, um, if you are a union-based organisation, to the unions. And uh, with the clients um, or your people, you need to make sure that they're trained in the new processes. Uh, and so if that's um, social distancing, you know, whatever the active sterilization, whatever the processes are that are going to keep it safe, you've got to nail that on the first day. But, but I also think because we went into lockdown so quickly, there are a number of organizations um, that I think that might have stock that they don't actually know what they've got. So you might want to do a, uh, an actual stock take to understand actually what you've got to play with uh, if you've got a, a, a warehouse. And, and then I, I think you want to immediately get in touch with your you know, customers uh, and work out with them uh, what they need and also uh, what they can pay and when they can pay. Uh, and what you might find is that as you move into um, day one, you might be tra changing your terms of trade. So, you know, traditionally it might be, have been that you could pay on the 20th of the month, but you might be moving that to actually at the moment just to get through this, we're seeking for seven day payment or um, cash for certain types of, of trade. Have a think about that. And if you are going to do that then and change those terms, have a conversation with your customers and talk about, you know, can they meet that? Can they meet their obligations there? And then once you've got a clear view of the demand side of it and about where you think things are going, that's to me when you, uh, when you can then go, well, what do I need to order uh, and how can I meet, meet things and trade and uh, change them, trade them. Uh, and, and then the lastly is if there is some technology that you need to uh, get up and going, you know, make sure you've got your orders in for that as fast as possible. So that's contactless payments, which you haven't had up until now, or if that is um, the ability to do click and collect, you know, I know that there's a, a, a gentleman in Rotorua who has um, done a, a rapid deployment of an app that's allowing people to do click and collect. And so there'll be a number of different people the, uh, and, and applications that support that. But get a hold of those things. Do what I would call and what we took term in the, in the technology industry, the minimum viable product. Get it up and running, try it out uh, and see if it serves the needs and then get back in contact with your clients and say, hey, did that work? Should we keep this going or how can we adapt that? I think that's what you want to do on day one and day two. Uh, and then as you start those new rhythms going, because everyone's been changing and there's a lot of I think there's sort of change fatigue, but being empathetic about where your people are at with this adjustment as well um, is, is then, then start to get into that sustainability view after week, I think the first couple of weeks, then start going, okay, well, if we're going to be out of level three and into level two, now start looking ahead for the next two weeks, what we might do if that adjustment. Yeah, well, there's one thing I would add to that. Um, and, and that is that the biggest risk for your employees will be restarting machinery. Okay. The minute you go back in, you've had machines that have been shut down, the, the plants have been shut down. It, you, that's the point of the highest risk whenever you're looking from a health and safety perspective. So actually to make sure that that process is not forgotten, it's always the spike, always occurs after machinery shut down. And for, for lots of small businesses, um, you know, I think that's a key point. Ingrid, if we don't have access to someone like Andrew and perhaps we're not quite as entrepreneurial and, and, and quite as agile as Andrew, where do we go to get some of the help that we need to help our small, medium-sized enterprise survive, potentially, if Andrew's right, thrive? Well, a um, place that I would start, uh, generally your financial advisor would be a, a good starting point given uh, you want to all returns you can from the tax organisation. And, uh, and then beyond that, the regional business support uh, group 
uh, can recommend local advisors if you're dealing with HR, uh, that body can um, be, uh, put you in touch with the, the key advisors for the problem you're trying to solve. All right, Ingrid Cronin Knight, NYOB's country manager, and Andrew Barnes. He's an entrepreneur, founder, and director of New Zealand's largest corporate trustee company, Perpetual Guardian. He's also a philanthropist. He's a busy man, and we thank you so much for making some time for us. Remember, we also want your questions. Email them through to video at nzherald.co.nz. Until next time, I'm Will Trafford. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.